Darwin's excellent adventure, evolution and law. The attraction of biological analogies on social scientists, in particular, seems to be so great that even the best minds are led astray. John Elster. Few voyages could have had such a profound effect as Darwin's five-year stint on the HMS Beagle. A novice naturalist on his departure in 1831, he returned a mature scientist with the set of basic ideas that were to prove truly revolutionary not only in biology but also in human affairs generally. If Galileo had shown that humankind was not at the center of the universe, Darwin was to demonstrate that humans were not the be-all and end-all of creation. Yet, as great oaks from small acorns grow, so Darwin's monumental ideas developed from his localized studies. For instance, while on his travels along the coast of South America with Thedot M. S. Beagle, Darwin witnessed a volcano erupt and was literally shaken by an earthquake. He recorded in eloquent detail the physical effects of such natural upheavals and their geological implications. However, he reserved his most telling description for the effect that these events had on his philosophical state of mind, a bad earthquake at once destroys our oldest associations, the earth, the very emblem of solidity, has moved beneath our feet like a thin crust over a fluid, one second of time has created in the mind a strange idea of insecurity which hours of reflection would not have produced. Darwin found himself not only obliged to reflect on the physical causes of his earthly security but also moved to challenge old theses and to question conventional accounts. In an attitude that was to mark his entire intellectual life, Darwin resolved to take nothing for granted and to put all propositions to rigorous and uncompromising scrutiny. The result was itself truly seismic. Two decades later, on November 24, 1859, this inspired, if wealthy, Amateur published his The Origin of Species and ignited perhaps the greatest intellectual revolution experienced by mankind. Not surprisingly, this revolution sent shockwaves through even the sheltered confines of the jurisprudential world. Ebbing and flowing with larger intellectual tides, the efforts to apply evolutionary ideas to law and legal development have continued during the intervening 150 years. However, it is not my intention to offer one more account of how the common law's development somehow manages to conform to a Darwinian dynamic. On the contrary, it is my objective is to show that any jurisprudential effort to mine the fields of biological research or trade off its prestige is fraught with perils. There is no reason at all to suppose, and many reasons not to suppose, that evolutionary science can be of any assistance in understanding the common law's historical operation or in grounding future initiatives in common law reform. However, there is much in the Darwinian canon that can be helpful in illuminating more clearly the failed efforts of modern jurisprudence to appreciate the workings of the common law. In particular, the debates around Darwin's great ideas provide a useful analogy to the debates and interventions that presently characterize jurisprudence. In talking about evolutionary biologists generally, the waggish Steve Jones might be speaking about their juristic counterparts when he notes that evolution is a political sofa that molds itself to the buttocks of the last to sit upon it. In this regard, common lawyers have put notions of Darwinian evolution to tendentious use. They have not only pummeled the political sofa, but, as is their wont, they have also insisted that there is something essential that is morally and politically attractive about the evolutionary process. They have been at pains to demonstrate that the shape into which the sofa has been molded is independent of their buttocks or anyone else's. The sofa of the common law has a shape and contour that, while molded by legal craftspersons and set on by legal sojourners over the centuries, conforms to an overarching design and structure. My foray into the evolution debate seeks to demonstrate law's pragmatic character while at the same time confirming adjudication's political quality. This chapter is divided into five parts. In the first part, I sketch the initial terms of engagement over Darwin in the scientific community. The emphasis is on mapping the territory, not on mining it. In the second section I explore the central tenets of Darwin's seminal contribution to science and identifies the hallmarks of a Darwinian approach as contrasted with other pseudo-Darwinian or Darwinistic approaches. In the next section, I take stock of recent efforts to extend the Darwinian explanatory dynamic beyond organic development to patterns of behavior. The implications for studying law, as one of the important arenas of human behavior are both obvious and troubling. In the fourth section I examine the different ways in which the evolutionary insight has found its way into legal studies and by which it claims to enhance an appreciation of law's historical development. In the final section, I point up the serious obstacles in the way of grounding an account of legal development in a parallel process to organic evolution.
law moves and evolves in a more reflective and less serendipitous way than the human beings that establish and fashion it. Throughout the chapter, I hint at a less imperialistic and more modest approach to evolutionary theory's relevance to appreciating the operation of the common law. The jurisprudential challenge ought to be more about explaining stability than explaining change, about accepting that no change is good or bad in itself, and about appreciating that local context is the measure of law's worth. By way of conclusion, I recognize that, when it comes to law and adjudication, evolution is as much a political responsibility as it is a natural necessity. The Oxford debate, the venue, the annual meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science in Oxford's newly built Museum of Natural History, and the occasion, a lecture on European social development by a relatively unknown American scholar, were fairly unremarkable. However, the impromptu debate that followed, although much anticipated by the unprecedented and eminent 700 persons in attendance, has become the fabled stuff of historical moment, occurring on Saturday, June 30, 1860, only six months after the publication of Charles Darwin's The Origin of Species. The face-off over the controversial theory of evolution by natural selection was between the conservative and skeptical Bishop of Oxford, Sir P. Sam Wilberforce, and the uncompromising scientist and leading public intellectual of the day. The 34-year-old Thomas Henry Bulldog Huxley, Darwin himself was not present because, as well as having a natural aversion to such appearances, he was suffering from a severe bout of an undiagnosed illness that was to plague him throughout his life and for which he was availing himself of the services of Dr. Lane's hydropathic clinic. The Oxford session was to be chaired by Reverend Robert Stevens Henslow, Darwin's old mentor from Cambridge. While the topic was supposed to be the subtle scientific implications of Darwin's evolutionary account, the agenda was much broader and more polarized. It pitted the established church order against an emerging scientific new wave. Who was to speak for nature, the clerics, or the scientists? In so doing, this Victorian debate set the tone and terms for intellectual debate about evolution and much more over the next century and a half. Ironically, in a building that was known as Oxford's new cathedral of science and whose construction had been made possible by biblical funds, Intellectual enlightenment seemed too readily sacrificed to personal vanity. There was no actual session on Darwin's origin scheduled on the meeting's program. However, the publication of the book and the heated reviews it had received were a central topic of conversation. With all the major players present, and Darwin himself absent, all was in place for a major and public set to. On that Thursday, there was a preliminary skirmish when Charles Daubeny, Oxford's professor of botany, gave a lecture on the final causes of the sexuality of plants with particular reference to Mr. Darwin's work. A mild supporter of Darwin's views, Daubeny offered a lecture that was marked more by its efforts to avoid partisanship than by its intellectual stimulation. This did not deter Robert Owen, a paleontologist and one of Darwin's staunchest scientific critics, from using the occasion to ignite fierce debate by venting his criticisms of Darwin's ideas. He argued that all the anatomical evidence was against Darwin's theory, the human brain was entirely distinct from that of gorillas and, therefore, Humans were not related to or descended from apes. Unable to contain himself, Huxley jumped to his feet and disparaged Owen's anatomical claims. He promised to refute Owen at length at a later date and in a more suitable forum. However, Huxley could not end without making some intemperate remarks about the clergy and suggested that churchmen should not worry even if it should be shown that apes were their ancestors. If Owen had lit the spark, Huxley had fanned the flames. The debate was ablaze and further fireworks were sure to follow. News spread among the attendees that the expected showdown between the warring factions was likely to take place on Saturday afternoon. The pretext was a lecture on the intellectual development of Europe considered with reference to the views of Mr. Darwin by Dr. William Draper of New York. Even though the museum was finished, all its furnishings had not been fully installed, so the lecture was to be held in the empty Radcliffe's library on the Upper West Gallery. So small were these rooms and so large was the audience that the reputed 700 persons in attendance spilled out onto the gallery itself and some adjoining rooms. Dr. Draper's lecture was rather boring, even though he promoted the controversial view that cultural progress was dependent on enlightened sciences being able to loosen the grip of stultifying theology. Needing no other encouragement, a righteous bishop Wilberforce took the floor. Briefed by Owen, the 54-year-old Wilberforce, while still an intellect to be reckoned with, had begun to rely more on bluster than brains. He was not known as Soapy Sam for nothing. As expected, he gave a powerful if overwrought renunciation of Darwin's theory, lambasting the evolutionary initiative and restating the creationist case. Echoing the words of his yet-to-be-published review of the origin, Wilberforce made sport with Darwin and his earnest defenders. After noting Darwin's apparent observations about our unsuspected cousinship with mushrooms, he asked, 
is it credible that, even if transmutations were rapidly occurring, all favorable varieties of turnips are tending to become men? At the end of his rather bombastic harangue and with the meeting already running to two hours, Wilberforce turned to Huxley, who was sitting close by him, and said, I should like to ask Professor Huxley who is about to tear me to pieces when I sit down, as to his belief in being descended from an ape, is it on his grandfather's or his grandmother's side that the ape ancestry comes in? Wilberforce sat down to thunderous applause, as Huxley stood up to speak, the tension was high, however. The normally snappy and high-strung Huxley managed to muzzle his bulldog tendencies, turning to his neighbor, Sir Benjamin Brodie, the Queen's surgeon, he whispered that the Lord hath delivered him into my hands. Huxley was by no means entirely persuaded by the full import of all Darwin's ideas about natural selection, indeed, he shared some of Wilberforce's more substantive and less rhetorical misgivings about the new evolutionary science, however, Huxley was prepared to suppress his reservations and to come to the defense of science against the religious establishment, even a flawed scientific theory was much preferred to stifling theocratic dogmatics, lacking the oratorical skills of Wilberforce, he began his retort by ably defending the basic structure of Darwin's arguments, then, in a deft stroke of gamesmanship, Huxley replied to Wilberforce's provocation by righteously stating that I should feel it no shame to have risen from such an origin, but I should feel it a shame to have sprung from one who prostituted the gifts of culture and eloquence to the service of prejudice and falsehood, I unhesitatingly affirm my preference for the ape. At the time, this was very strong stuff, a pregnant member of the audience, Lady Jane Brewster, fainted at hearing a bishop so publicly denounced, and in such a hot and crammed room, Huxley's performance was met with equally raucous approval to Wilberforce's, suggesting that the audience was impressed as much by the theatrics of the performances as their substance. But the debate was not finished. Several noted members of the audience rose to speak, including a Bible brandishing Robert Fitzroy, Darwin's former friend and captain of the HMS Beagle on which Darwin had made his fateful trip some thirty years before, an increasingly unstable Fitzroy, later to commit suicide denounced Darwin as a heretic and apostate, expressing regret at the fact that he had given Darwin the opportunity to formulate his theory on his world travels, he asserted that he could not find anything enabling in the thought of being the descendant of even the most ancient ape. Less impassioned contributions were made by Robert Henslow and John Lubbock, a noted mathematician and astronomer, in defense of Darwin. The final speaker was Joseph Hooker, the director of the Royal Botanical Gardens at Kew who had his own political as well as scientific reasons for championing the Darwinian cause. In contrast to the fevered interventions that preceded his, Hooker wisely made a less emotional and more learned riposte to Wilberforce's assault, although not as memorable as Huxley's verbal fireworks. His hard-hitting arguments against Wilberforce probably did more for the longer-term benefit of the Darwinian cause. Facts in this science which before were inexplicable to me became one by one explained by Darwin's theory and conviction has been thus gradually forced upon an unwilling convert. After Hooker's point-by-point -point refutation of Wilberforce's remarks, the bishop declined an invitation to respond and the meeting was closed after almost four hours. It had been a historic occasion that left its mark on both science and religion for decades to come. Opinion was divided on which side came out best. Whereas rampant Huxley and the scientific academy claimed to have rooted a chagrined clerical establishment, a smug Wilberforce felt that he had won the day over the parvenu scientists. The fact that the debate took place at all was at least as important as its immediate outcome. The terms had been set for a contest between science and religion that still rages today. Darwin himself was kept fully informed of events by his legion of correspondents. Not surprisingly, the temper of these reports was largely positive. Although Hooker claimed to have been as dull as ditch water, Darwin was grateful for his support, and Huxley's support and ranked his affection as more important than talk of fame, honor, pleasure, wealth, I would like to have heard your triumphing over the bishop, dot 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 I fully believe that our cause will in the long run prevail. In a letter to Darwin, Hugh Falconer gave his own first-hand recollections and reported that the saponaceous bishop got basted and lauded by Huxley. Owen also came in for such a put-down by Huxley as I have never witnessed within my experience of scientific discussion. Your interests were most tenderly watched over by your devoted elves. In light of these heartening comments, Darwin was further galvanized and, although he wrote to Azagre that Origin had stirred up the mud with vengeance, he stuck to his selectionist guns. Over the remaining twenty years of his life, Darwin spent his time with his large family at his beloved Down House, working productively on a prolific series of monographs and books, while he eschewed the public spotlight and struggled with his poor health. His stature grew. On his death in 1882, 
He had left an intellectual and social legacy that continues to dominate society's scientific and social agenda. Ironically, he was buried in Westminster Abbey, the epicenter of the English Christian establishment. Whatever the immediate aftermath of the Oxford debate, evolution remains one of the hottest of hot-button issues. The battle between religion and science continues apace. As the intervening decades have powerfully revealed, while science has gone from strength to strength, organized religion is not so easily vanquished. Being based on faith, it is not as susceptible to reasoned argument and scientific refutation as some would like to believe. The persistence of the creationist cause, especially in the United States, is a powerful reminder of the profound challenge that Darwin's ideas offer to traditional understandings. Moreover, the scientific cause has not always been helped by the fact that many of those who claim to be inspired by Darwin's work have pursued their own supposedly secular theories with an orthodox zeal and evangelical spirit that would embarrass all except the most devoted religious fanatic. In the hands of such evolutionary fundamentalists, Darwinism becomes a worldview that encompasses the hierarchically related concepts of change, order, direction, progress, and perfectibility. Bishop Wilberforce might well disagree with its content, but he would likely sympathize with its anti-selectionist sentiments. Indeed, fired by a deep antipathy toward all forms of established privilege, Huxley's own later work on social evolution was as much driven by his political desire to professionalize science and to effect a meritocracy as by any simple scientific impulse. In general, it can be reported that, in the ensuing 150 years since Origin was published, the understandable temptation to put Darwin to moral, political, or even religious effect has proved irresistible in many quarters. However, as the Oxford quarrel plainly suggests, there is much more at stake in discussing Darwin than the details of a research biological theorem. Whatever else it is, science is never only science and the difference between science and other pursuits is much less stark than is generally conceded. The negotiations, between working scientists, as to what counts as a proof or what constitutes a good essay are no more or less orderly than any argument between lawyers and politicians. In the case of Darwin, the stakes are so high because it seems to promise a possible solution to the most pressing questions of human existence. Where did it all begin? How did we get here from there? What can we do about the future? And to do so with the authority of science. Along with Isaac Newton and Albert Einstein, Darwin is considered one of the greatest scientists ever. His work has not only changed the way that scientists go about their work but has also affected the way people think about the world and their place in it. In this way. Darwin has come to represent something apart from the historical person and published words of the actual Charles Darwin. Indeed, what Darwin himself did and did not mean is much less important than what can be said about evolution in light of reading Darwin against and within a context of 21st century science and sensibilities. Nevertheless, as is the double-edged fate of all great ideas, Darwin's account of evolution through natural selection is the subject of heated debates about its meaning, import and implications. Many have been unable to withstand the dangerous tendency to utilize his factual explanations as evaluative guidelines and to convert what is into what should be. At its worst, this has resulted in the situation in which many faux Darwinians embrace the Promethean impulse to put evolutionary theory and therefore nature in the service of a preferred social or ideological vision. In an ironic twist, by insisting that a Darwinian world has Darwinian purposes, evolutionary science has become the new theology, with Darwin himself as its reluctant messiah figure. Nonetheless, insofar as there is something that has come to be called a Darwinian account of evolution, it deserves to be distinguished and rescued from the spectrum of derivative theoretical offerings that are more Darwinistic than Darwinian. It is tantamount to ideological sophistry or religious fundamentalism to claim that something is true simply because Darwin did or did not say something. It is much better to view Darwin's theory as a launching pad for various ideas about the phenomenon of change and development in the natural world. Indeed, it is a common rap against Darwin himself that his theory is simply a reflection of unjustification for prevailing social conditions and values in that it relied on the whole 19th century capitalist laissez-faire mentality of competition, struggle, violence, self-interest, and so on. While he did place some of these values at the heart of his work, Darwin's ideas amount to so much more than an abject apology for the status quo. Of course, Darwin was affected by his own cultural and social milieu, but no more, or less, than any other scholar. The response to such a charge is not to dismiss the ideas or else there will be no ideas left to consider, all ideas are generated somewhere by someone. The challenge is to read the impugned writings with knowledge of their creative context. So instructed, one can acknowledge Darwin's ideas as being part of their milieu but not as being entirely confined by it. In particular, one can note that, unlike many of his intellectual friends and foes, 
Darwin resisted the naturalistic fallacy of turning his descriptive ideas to prescriptive effect, his was a tale about what happened, not what should happen. Indeed, Darwin resisted all efforts to discover any ethical imperatives in his biological analysis. Unfortunately, this cannot be said of many who claimed to be writing under his tutelage or influence. Darwin's Evolution In the early 19th century, the prevailing view of evolution was that there was a hierarchical arrangement to nature that placed humans at its apex, change and variation had come to a natural end with humanity's ascendancy. Further, when Darwin took his fateful trip on HMS Beagle to the Galapagos Archipelago in the 1830s, the prevailing wisdom among biologists was the Lamarckian notion that individuals adapt to their environment and those altered characteristics are inherited by the individual's progeny. Darwin took this attractive suggestion and turned it on its head. He got the basic idea in 1838 that, in the struggle for existence, favorable variations would tend to be preserved and unfavorable ones to be destroyed. After over 20 years of further experiments and reflection, Darwin published his revolutionary The Origin of Species in 1859. He had actually produced a first draft by 1844, but his natural caution persuaded him to hold off a publishing until he had more evidence and was more confident of the veracity of its central thesis. It was only in 1858, when he learned that Alfred Russell Wallace, a younger naturalist, was about to steal his thunder with a similar account of evolution that Darwin finally resolved to pull together and complete his ideas on natural selection. He had the finished manuscript in his publisher's hands in less than a year. In his elegant and technical tome, translated into ten European languages in his lifetime alone, Darwin's revolutionary contribution was manifold. He explained how that process worked, how all species are related, how evolution was not planned or inevitable and how Homo sapiens was not only related to more primitive life forms but also was not the necessary outcome of the evolutionary process. Accordingly, Darwin did not so much introduce the idea of evolution as develop a particular version of evolution and highlight the particular mechanism by which evolution occurs. Conceding that nature had the appearance of being designed by some grand and benevolent hand, he asserted that the apparent design was the relentless result of blind chance. A designing deity is displaced by the impression of one who might not actually exist. Origin was to begin a revolution in human thought that would at least parallel, if not actually surpass, any before it. Although Darwin's fabled book is densely packed with his amassed evidence and supporting argumentation, the central thesis of origin is as simple as it is seismic. Organisms create more offspring than can survive. In the procreation of these offspring, mutations occur randomly, naturally and are as likely to be detrimental as beneficial to the organism. These mutations do not occur, as Lamarck had insisted, as a designed function of willed adaptation. Those mutated offspring that are more able to adapt to the local environment will survive and thrive. Mutation proposes, selection disposes. Over time and across populations, these successful variations will accumulate slowly and steadily so that small local changes will have massive enduring effects. New species will develop and even more species will disappear. Darwin called this process natural selection, and it was offered as the destructive as well as the creative force of evolution. In what became his most controversial claim, Darwin insisted that there is no predetermined path or design to evolutionary development because there is a contingent mix of chance, that is, organisms mutate unpredictably, and necessity, that is, selection favors the most adaptive or the least maladaptive in the biological sciences. Evolution is simply a synonym for change. Unlike in the social sciences, including law, there is no common supposition of improvement or advancement in any universally appealing sense. In short, evolution is an empirical phenomenon of successive alteration that has no necessary link to normative claims of value. Adaptation to changing conditions is the only standard of success, and this is only temporary and local in character. Once conditions change, an adapted feature can become maladapted to its circumstances. Contingency is the order of the day. The dynamism in nature is brought about by the fact that organisms selected by past conditions exist in present conditions, such that any change in conditions will result in different challenges for those organisms and, therefore, different organisms will begin to thrive. Natural selection is a game of tag in which the past never catches up. And, the naturally selected become the selected unnatural, the fittest survive and become unfit and do not survive. Darwin's work makes it clear that he had no tolerance for the view that evolution was a purifying platonic process, that is, variant forms are eliminated so that a species true being can assert itself, or Panglossian process, that is, everything happens for the best. Although quantitative change will ultimately result in qualitative difference. Evolution is basically the long and gradual process through which natural selection works on genetic variations so that organisms adapt to their surrounding environment, 
because that environment is constantly changing and interacting with these adapted mutating organisms. There is no guarantee that progress in any normative sense will occur. Evolution is about historical change, not normative advancement. Indeed, evolution can be instructively viewed as being about failure and elimination. Some organisms simply do not have the luck to get the right genes at the right time and so are not better able to adapt to prevailing conditions. It simply is not the case that nature is continually building the so-called better organism and moving towards some perfected form. There are no fixed or real types, only continuous variations type is an abstraction and variation is real. While a workable level of prediction is possible in local circumstances and over short periods of time, the sheer complexity and richness of contingent life ensure that more ambitious predictions about nature's unfolding determinacy are futile. The lesson of Darwin is that, like all other organisms, humans breed for reproduction and survival, not for finding deep truths about the universe. This does not mean that humans cannot search for philosophical truths, but it is not their purpose or raison d'etre. Thus, Evolutionary biology can only help fix where we have been, not where we are going. Humanity does not evolve toward anything, but only away from something. Evolution is about the been and gone and the here and now. It does not plan for or cater to the future. To maintain otherwise is to mistake entirely the central thrust of an evolutionary process. To say more than this about Darwin's basic evolutionary thesis is to court controversy. Even the truncated account that I had given will probably arouse suspicion and dissent in some quarters. This is because, in a sardonic twist of historical appreciation, Darwin's work has come to be treated as having political, ethical, and even religious significance. Sometimes, Darwin is treated as a messianic figure, like Jesus or Muhammad. Other times, he is considered to have midwifed, like Karl Marx and Adam Smith. The birth of a secular ideology. Cast in such extravagant terms, the struggle to claim the soul of Darwinian evolutionary theory for a particular political, ethical, or religious campaign has gone on largely unabated. As well as join issue over the basic merit of Darwin's central thesis, scholars and commentators divide into different camps over its reach and provenance. Given a little bit of time to acclimatize and update, Bulldog Huxley and Soapy Samuel Buffus would soon be at home in contemporary debates over the meaning, significance, and reach of evolution. Indeed, the creationist and social Darwinian projects still have a considerable hold over contemporary imaginations. Ironically, it is Darwin who might be more disturbed at the turn that events have taken. As things have turned out, Darwin has as much to fear from some of his evolutionary chums as his creationist enemies. Too many have failed to remember that the strength of a good idea is in its conceptual limits as much as in its central insights. Whatever else it is, Darwin's account of evolution is not the elusive philosopher's stone. Nevertheless, this has not prevented scores of scholars from treating it as an alchemical device to answer all the mysteries of the biological world and human affairs, including law. In the next section, I pursue and contrast one particular and popular take on Darwin, the so-called ultra-Darwinian approach, with a more traditional continuation of the Darwinian initiative. This will serve as an introduction to efforts to apply an evolutionary perspective to the problems of jurisprudence and law. Designing genes, there is still a significant group that holds to a fairly traditional understanding of Darwin's ideas. While there are some differences between them, these Darwinians adopt a view of evolution that Darwin might himself recognize and find palatable. This Darwinian stance is entirely different from the popularized Spencerian concept of a natural world at war with itself and in which a nature red and tooth and claw ethic drives the struggle over the survival of the fittest, the infamous phrase that is Spencer's, not Darwin's. Darwin talked much more about organisms that, seeking to find an equilibrium with their environment and neighbors were constantly responding and adapting to change. Nor did Darwin believe that there was any pattern to this endless proliferation of mutated organisms and new species. For him, evolution was a haphazard process with no ex-ante trend, but only ex-post tendencies, evolution only revealed itself in hindsight and then only to the practiced eye. Evolution has no foresight and, therefore, is unable to anticipate or accommodate future effects. Because change is small, mutation unpredictable and the interaction between organism and environment so increasingly and bafflingly complex, it is futile to search for or speculate on a grand plan, evolution is a blind, contingent, haphazard, and entirely opportunistic affair. In particular, Darwin's refusal to concede that humankind's existence was necessary, inevitable, or preordained and that it, like all other species, is the continuing product of contingent circumstances what got Darwin into such metaphysical hot water. Adherence to this critical insight is what has kept his scientific heirs there. While Darwin concluded origin by stating that there is a grandeur in this view of life, and, from so simple a beginning endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved, 
he expressly resisted the temptation to reach a more heroic or hubristic resolution. While Darwin had offered a theoretical explanation that was intended to account for all living development, that theory was entirely descriptive and made no claim to prescribe or predict such development along moral lines. Nevertheless, even within this Darwinian, as opposed to the faux Darwinian or Darwinistic, camp, there are divergences and differences of opinion. These disputes are the stuff of scientific development. Many of the debates concern issues and gaps left open by Darwin, much turns on differing emphases in competing explanations rather than on fundamental divergences in assumptions. For instance, considerable energy is expended over the disputed pace of evolution. Darwinian evolutionists divide over whether evolution proceeds at a steady and gradual rate or by stages of punctuated equilibrium in which change happens in geologically brief speciation events separated by long periods of stasis. While resolution of this issue is important, and its continued irresolution is utilized by the creationists in their anti-evolution critique, it does not go to the heart of the Darwinian account or demand a radical reformulation of its central components. However, in some cases, what begins as an in-house dispute turns into something larger and results in a breakaway approach. An important instance of this is the disagreement over the level at which speciation and evolution occurs. Whereas some insist that the struggle for survival is best understood from the perspective of genes rather than individuals, others prefer to emphasize the operation of evolution at many levels, not simply the genetic and the historical importance of environmental factors on the evolutionary process. Behind this apparently technical clash is a much more fundamental quarrel about the basic dynamic of evolution. Is natural selection the exclusive or primary explanation of all organic behavior and change, or are there other important factors at work? Do Darwin's basic insights apply to cultural psychological development as well as biological genetic evolution? From a jurisprudential perspective, can legal development be satisfactorily explained in terms of principles analogous to natural selection? Answers to these questions tend to determine whether particular scholars make the shift away from traditional and pluralistic Darwinian ideas to a more radical and monistic neo-Darwinianism. It is not so much that these so-called ultra-Darwinians disagree over the basic Darwinian thesis or that they see any grand design at work. It is that they wish to extend Darwin's notion of natural selection to absolutely everything. Indeed, there is much about the ultra-Darwinians that is entirely compatible with a traditional Darwinian view and that advances many of its basic commitments. For instance, Richard Dawkins's conclusions that there is nothing inherently progressive about evolution and that, over a long enough time and under particular conditions, it is possible to derive anything from anything else contribute greatly to the Darwinian canon. Nevertheless, it is the extent to which Dawkins and others have been prepared to push these claims that has proved so controversial. Not content to explain the evolution of all biological organisms in line with a Darwinian evolutionary dynamic, they have made the audacious claim that the behavior of such organisms, including and especially humans, is entirely explicable in the same terms. Whether scavenging for food or going shopping for watches and whether scrambling for sexual supremacy or reflecting on sexual mores, Humans and other organisms are seen to be striving to adapt to their environment and ensure the survival of the fittest. Accordingly, the central claim of ultra-Darwinians is that relentless process of natural selection resulted in brains equipped with particular information processing predispositions that consequently yield non-random and hence evolutionarily driven behaviors. In the same way, therefore, that flora and fauna thrive or die as a result of their genes ability to survive and prosper, so human behavior is said to be coordinated and controlled by a similar dynamic. Picking up on these themes, Daniel Dennett argues that absolutely everything, including culture, religion, language, psychology, and morality, is subject to and conditioned by natural selection. Chastising others for their fearful failure to accept the full ramifications of Darwin's dangerous idea, he offers an understanding of natural selection as an uncompromising denial of all biological essentialism and as a neutral, algorithmic process, applicable to an extremely wide range of phenomena and capable of achieving immense feats by slow accumulation over large extents of time and space. Though there are obvious differences between those things produced by human design and those produced by evolution, biology is considered to be engineering at some fundamental level. While he rejects Hildnesian Panglossianism, Dennett sees adaptionism as a fertile source of explanations for natural development. However, in offering such explanations, he insists that there is no place at all for skyhooks, that is, entirely mysterious, pre-existing devices that enable some problem to be solved entirely independently of ordinary processes of design, and that the only bad reductionism is a greedy reductionism that tries to do without cranes, that is, 
tricks that allow design to proceed faster but that build on existing foundations. He predicates his application of Darwinian evolution to culture on the concept of memes. These are to concepts or ideas what genes are to biology. They are propagated from person to person. They compete with one another and they allow humans to transcend their genetics. While Dennett doubts that an equally powerful science of memetics is possible, he concludes that genetics and memetics work on the same principles of design by unthinking processes of selection. Traditional Darwinians reject these ultra-Darwinian claims. Not only do they take exception to the contention that the gene is the basic unit of evolution and that individuals are disposable vehicles for the survival of genes, but they also resist the imperialistic assertion that all mental and cultural life is completely explainable by a fundamental Darwinian process of natural selection in which human genes and memes struggle for survival. Traditional Darwinians take a much more pluralistic stance and insist that it is mistaken to bracket Darwin's neglected rider that I am convinced that natural selection has been the main but not the exclusive means of modification. However, theirs is much more than a fundamentalist argument over what Darwin did or did not say, as evidence that it is a profound error to credit natural selection with being the exclusive or primary cause of all organic behavior, they point to the crucial role that statistical accidents, environmental devastation, structural limits to organisms, long-term drift, and blind chance play in the history of evolutionary development on function and form, in this way. The traditional Darwinian stance cautions against any theoretical offering that attempts to shoehorn everything into one closed and therefore static and mechanistic explanation, a human will struggles within and against a particular environment and affects as it is affected by that environment in its efforts to do what is best, offering science on a grand scale. The ultra-Darwinian's work seems to be premised on the belief that it might be possible to understand all there is to know about everything, including problems not yet known or even understood by a resort to one simple evolutionary formula. This is indeed a dangerous idea and a reductionist one that stands in stark contrast to both the exposition of evolutionary theory and the actual practice of evolution itself. While Occam's razor can often be a useful intellectual tool, it can cleave deeply as well as shave closely. For the more traditional Darwinians, it is silly to assume that all aspects of physiology and behavior are optimally adapted responses to environmental challenges, there are constraints on short-term gains that may become long-term losses. It is accepted that natural selection remains the only theory that explains how adaptive complexity, not just any old complexity, can arise, because it is the only non-miraculous, forward direction theory in which how well something works plays a causal role in how it came to be. Nonetheless, Darwinians refuse to assume that an organism's current utility has any necessary connection to its evolutionary origin or that no other formative forces are in play. Psychological traits can be inherited through learning and cultural adaptation. Moreover, the recognition of non-adaptive features does not imply an arbitrary or non-intelligible process of change and even less a rejection of a Darwinian perspective. It is simply not enough to tell a plausible story that is consistent with natural selection to prove that its processes are the inevitable causal origin of particular innovative features. There are many plausible explanatory possibilities and there is a much heavier burden on those who wish to claim that natural selection is the only dynamic at work. Moreover, Darwinians maintain that it is a false contest to pit selection against constraint. The former is a function of the constraining context as much as a separate process. Without context and constraint, there would be no natural selection in the sense of a recognizable process. Consequently, it is simply wrong to explain everything in terms of adaptive necessity. Organisms are the result of manifold compromises between variability and stability, fittest is an entirely contingent, relative and descriptive label and may signify nothing more compelling than being the immediately best, although globally not very good, of a bad bunch. In this way, evolution is a strange mix of universal predictability, that is, natural selection is a dominant process in biological development, and local unpredictability, that is, the actual outcome of that general process in any given local and historical instance cannot be predicted. The environment is subject to various stochastic processes that, by definition, lead to unpredictable and contingent results in any specific situation. As regards human development, the major challenge for the ultra-Darwinians is to demonstrate that a particular behavior is genetically driven rather than socially conditioned. This will require the designation of a particular genotype or allele pairing for each particular behavior and, on the basis of existing scientific predictions, will be well nigh impossible to do. Also, while traditional Darwinians can concede that there may well be a contingent mix of the natural and the nurtured, 
the ultra-Darwinians are obliged to defend the extravagant claim that behavior is almost all genetically driven, while the mind itself may be a product of natural selection. It does not follow that any particular patterns of behavior are also similarly produced. Conversely, although evolution is an amoral and non theological process, it does not mean that it cannot produce moral and purpose-driven entities. However, it is an unwarranted leap to assume that such morality and purposefulness is reducible to a single and simple formula. As one commentator has neatly put it, even if you can build a bottle from which the desired genie emerges, you can't reduce the genie to the bottle once it's out. While it is decked out in the trappings of empirical science, the ultra-Darwinians are offering a very idealistic and metaphysical proposal. At bottom, I think that it is neither possible nor desirable to reduce inquiries into human culture to an entirely empirical enterprise that obviates the need for ethical reflection and contextual appreciation. Within such a mindset, there is a grave danger that people will be reduced only to their genes and that natural inclination, for example, violent behavior, will trump social imperative, for example, individual responsibility. This cautionary insight has particular salience for understanding the relevance of Darwinian evolutionary theory to law and adjudication. At its most essential, therefore, the basic bone of contention between Darwinians and ultra-Darwinians is over the application of Darwin's ideas to human behavior. There is general agreement that, because humans are a biological species, their creation and development are readily explicable by the simple logic of Darwinian evolution. This means neither that the existence of humans was inevitable or planned nor that continued existence is guaranteed. Like dinosaurs and dodos, humans are vulnerable to the extreme deprivations of their natural environment. However, unlike all other organisms, to date, humans have a greater and more sophisticated capacity for conscious planning and impacting the environment in which they live. They manage to affect and shape their environment as they are affected and shaped by it. Consequently, human development is not entirely reactive or adaptive. People are able to exert a powerful influence on the very factors that Darwinian evolution considers to be the motive force of biological progress. This means that any attempt to reduce the study of human activity to the same familiar evolutionary dynamic that works for fish and fowl is unconvincing. As the leading Darwinian, and unabashed critic of ultra-Darwinianism, the late Stephen Jay Gould, puts it. We are glorious accidents of an unpredictable process with no drive to complexity, not the expected results of evolutionary principles that yearn to produce a creature capable of understanding the mode of its necessary construction. A key question, therefore, for Darwinian adherents is how to account for those human behaviors that are the result of conscious planning and intellectual design. Can they be brought within the explanatory provenance of a modified Darwinian dynamic? or are they outside its descriptive ambit and, therefore, a challenge to its whole scientific status? Law is one of those human processes. At bottom, law is a collective human endeavor to cope with and control the world around them. Indeed, law is an artifact that, like morality and psychology, seeks to check as much as adapt to the environmental forces and natural tendencies that comprise its nurturing context. Accordingly, at the nexus of the intersection between evolution and law are the problematic claims for the nature of human progress and the progress of human nature. In addressing these claims, the ultra-Darwinian's ideas amount to a bold and unsettling contribution that has considerable relevance to the debate about the development and operation of the common law. Of course, the power of a good idea is to be found in its limits and caveats as well as its depth and force. In this, the application of ultra-Darwinian ideas to legal evolution is no exception. It is to a consideration of the efforts by lawyers and legal theorists to utilize Darwinian evolutionary ideas in the jurisprudential project of understanding the common law that I now term, jurisprudence and evolution. Since its first expression almost 150 years ago, Darwin's controversial thesis about biological development has been cannibalized or poached by most other disciplines. Law is no exception to this trend. Indeed, the evolutionary metaphor has always loomed over jurisprudential efforts to explicate the nature of the common law. At times, its invocation has been modest, oblique, and implicit. At other times, its usage has been much more sweeping, bold, and explicit. The most potent use of the evolutionary narrative in law has been distinctly non-Darwinian, and, not infrequently, anti-Darwinian, in thrust and ambition. Evolution has most often been used as a catch-all term for general development and change. Insofar as this usage is entirely casual, those jurists who talk about law evolving do not analogize or seek identification with evolutionary theory in any strictly Darwinian or scientific sense. Not averse to trading off the hard currency of scientific explanation. 
such theorists intend to connote some aspect of systematic and directed development in their accounts of the common law. However, there has also been a more Darwinian tendency in the jurisprudential literature. In taking this general approach, contemporary jurists participate in the much more expansive project of the humanities that attempts to explain the idea and history of progress through a recourse to the prestigious discourse of scientific authority. In these modernist efforts, evolutionary theory has proved to be a useful and authoritative device. Its advocates claim to resolve the complex mysteries of human progress by reference to one simple formula. This is an ambitious and, if successful, truly momentous achievement in the history of jurisprudential thought. Like individuals in many other disciplines, legal theorists were initially captivated by the seductive appeal of a Darwinian approach. Indeed, some of the American titans of the jurisprudential pantheon, Arthur Corbin, John Wigmore, and Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., looked to Darwin's ideas to explain the gradual development of the common law over time. For instance, Holmes talked about how law evolves in line with the felt necessities of the time in much the same way as evolution adapts existing biological structures to different uses in different time periods. Drawing on the work of Savigny and Maine, he saw that the rudimentary ideas of primitive legal systems were transformed over time into the complex features of modern legal systems by a process in which the struggle for life among competing ideas led to an ultimate victory and survival of the strongest. It is like the niggardly uninventiveness of nature in its other manifestations, with its few smells or colors or types, its short list of elements, working along in the same slow way from compound to compound until the dramatic impressiveness of the most intricate compositions, which we call organic life makes them seem different in kind from the elements out of which they are made, when set opposite to them in direct contrast. The most interesting feature of these late 19th century ideas is the location of agency in this evolutionary analogy. Attempting to marry change and development with some unitary coherence and unchanging quality, the tendency was, if only rhetorically, to use descriptive terms that slip too easily between the passive and the active or even between descriptive and prescriptive. Indeed, some contemporary scholars have continued this unfortunate tradition by effecting such a merging of perspectives. After a considerable fallow period in which evolutionary accounts fell out of intellectual fashion, there has been a revival of efforts in the past few decades to utilize evolutionary theory to illuminate legal and jurisprudential problems. These modern efforts have been much bolder, more explicit, and more sophisticated. Contributing to a tendency in the humanities generally, Modern jurists have now begun to extend this scientific theory not only to explain the past of the common law but also to analyze its present dynamic and predict future direction. Inspired by the evolutionary insight, jurists, through such jurisprudential efforts, have taken their self-defined responsibility to be the sustained attempt to delve a little deeper and offer a more compelling and defensible account of how this common law process actually works. Their basic task has been divided into three components to offer a narrative that explains the basic legal material being described, to identify a direction or purpose to that narrative, and to elucidate a mechanism by which changes or developments in the narrative occur. While some accounts only focus on a couple of these components, a few seek to provide an integrated theory that claims to tie all three together by way of a simple logic or algorithm. This reliance on evolutionary narratives ranges from extended analogies to full-blown homologies. Viewed collectively as a series of complex narratives describing the development of law, morality, social systems, and biological explanations of behavior, they seek to fuse the prestigious cache of scientific explanation with the normative framework, imputed or asserted, of legal systems. There are three main tendencies. The first suggests that law develops through gradual and slow incremental change in much the same way that organisms change in the natural world. The historical development of particular legal doctrines are explicated in such a way as to reveal the striking analogy with organisms' experience in grappling with the demands of their environmental situation. No explicit claim is made that there is an actual as opposed to metaphorical connection between law and evolutionary theory. The second uses so-called complexity theory to emphasize the sustainability of legal ideas or rules in given contexts, emphasizing that law and context are mutually determinative. It claims to explain legal development through mathematical modeling, not as compared with it. While it offers a more nuanced account of systemic adaption and fitness, it draws directly on the work of the ultra-Darwinians. Thus, it stands somewhere between analogy and homology. The third offers an autopoietic theory of law as an organism-like entity that adapts, transforms and stabilizes itself from its own resources in response to changes in its broader environment. Pointing up the complex dynamics of legal systems, 
it attempts to explain legal development as a self-validating process of reflexivity. There is an increasing sophistication in the analogies or indeed the modeling used in these evolutionary paradigms. This includes attempts to purge from these models any sort of purpose or directedness and to reframe that characterization in terms of stochastic models, including scientific terms such as exogenous and endogenous factors, equilibria, variability, dynamics, and the like. Nevertheless, Whereas some go on to claim some nature to law and others merely assert that such analogies are good heuristic devices by which we might understand change and development in law, they all claim to rely on some notion of Darwinian evolution. However, each theorist cannot seem to avoid falling into the same trap that Darwin was assiduous to avoid, turning the descriptive power of the evolutionary insight into a platform for prescriptive efforts at reform or redirection. For example, in an otherwise enlightening and rigorous account of corporate law, Robert Clark is not content to identify contingent patterns in the law but seems compelled to attribute them to law's universal nature. His drift from descriptive analysis to prescriptive proposal is almost seamless. Moreover, these legal Darwinians seem unable to keep the notions of evolution and progress separate. They not only see change everywhere but also treat progress as something that is almost inevitable. Indeed, Although many of these scholars warn against the pitfalls of a Panglossian mentality in which it is considered that this is the best of all possible worlds and everything that happens in it is for the best, they still manage to put a wonderfully positive and normative gloss on law's development. In so doing, they begin to desert the one commitment that seems to divide the creationist Sopi Sams from the Darwinian Bulldogs, that there is no redemptive or miraculous force that is orchestrating or driving the world forward in some particular direction and to some pre-assigned destination. Looked at from a traditional Darwinian standpoint, the legal creationists and the neo-Darwinians are simply flip sides of the same coin, they both trade in the same moral currency and barter in the same marketplace, albeit with different styles and ambitions. These are big and sweeping claims, and they have to be substantiated. Consequently, Instead of ranging broadly and loosely over the whole of the evolutionary terrain, I concentrate in this chapter on one particular and fundamental argument, putting aside the more overtly creationist and social Darwinian themes of much contemporary jurisprudence until later, I analyze the extent to which these neo-Darwinian perspectives on law do or can satisfy the basic requirements of any account that claims to be Darwinian as opposed to Darwinistic in form and content. Fortunately or unfortunately, their project cannot be sustained. Despite its obvious academic allure and apparent intellectual pedigree, evolutionary theory has little to offer traditional efforts to understand the development and direction of the common law. If, and even this must remain a moot point, Darwin's basic insights, contingent development, indeterminate content, non-essentialist analysis, local predictability, and universal indifference, have anything to tell lawyers and jurists, it is that evolutionary development is a corrosive idea that does more to undercut the grand explanatory ambitions of mainstream jurisprudence than to ground or achieve them. Darwin's central message was to warn against any inclination toward explanations that turn scientific method into moral or political philosophy. He was diligent in his efforts not only to avoid crude reductionism but also to resist turning evolution to evangelical effect. The wonder indeed is, on the theory of natural selection, that more cases of the want of absolute perfection have not been detected. If this has been a hard lesson for biologists and scientists, it has been a near impossible one for lawyers and jurists to learn and accept. After Darwin, it has often been observed that it is a dangerous maneuver to attempt the crossing of a canyon into leaps. As sage and obvious as this advice is, it has been ignored by most jurists who seek to offer an evolutionary account of legal development. Indeed, full of scientific bravado. They have actually sought to cross the gaping chasm of jurisprudential exposition in three distinct leaps. Audacity is no substitute for common sense. In mounting a convincing case for why and how the common law develops and changes in line with an evolutionary dynamic, jurists must overcome the same hurdles as their biological counterparts, they must be able to provide theories of variation, that is, the mechanism by which slightly different and potentially new organisms are created, selection, that is, the process by which a choice is made as to which of the different candidates so generated are favored and which are discarded, and transmission, that is, the method by which the relevant characteristics of the successful organisms are passed on to succeeding generations. In the physical sciences, there is substantial agreement on the variation and transmission theories. However, as I have tried to demonstrate, there is considerable disagreement over the selection process, at least as it applies to human behavior. Some simply insist that natural selection is tantamount to being the exclusive process for the both organic and behavioral changes. Others maintain that, while it is a dominant process, 
it is by no means the exclusive one because natural selection is also affected by statistical accidents, environmental devastation, structural limits to organisms, long-term drift, and blind chance. However, notwithstanding these disagreements, there exists a core set of shared beliefs about the basic operation of the evolutionary dynamic. Before showing how this plays out in the legal world of human behavior, I want to present a simple and stylized example of evolution in the natural world. A black-furred animal lives in a fairly temperate climate in a geographical area with abundant shelter and sustenance. Although it does have certain predators, it has become reasonably well suited to its environmental circumstances. It flourishes. However, over time, the climate begins to change, the weather becomes colder, shelter and sustenance are reduced, and there is a vastly increased amount of snowfall which remains for most of the year. Less camouflaged and more exposed to its predators, the animal is no longer so well suited to its environment, and reproductive success is diminished. It would clearly be of assistance to the animal if it became better adapted to its changed environment. In particular, a lighter shade of fur would be beneficial so that it would be less conspicuous in the snowy conditions. However, the animal cannot plan or will such a beneficial change. It is simply not possible for an animal to change its own organic structure as best suits its present environmental situation. Nevertheless, all is not lost. Animals do change over time, but in an entirely unplanned and unpredictable way. Because no animal reproduces in perfectly clone-like fashion, different mutations of the black-furred animal will be constantly produced. Some might well be lighter-furred than others. Those that are will likely be favored in the reproductive cycle and those that are not will likely perish. The light fur genes will pass on to offspring in greater numbers than darker fur ones. None of this is predictable as there may be no mutations that produce lighter fur and so, all other things being equal, the brown furred animal might become extinct, like almost 99% of all species that have ever existed. Mutation is a chance process that has no sense of the needs of an organism's situation and no ear for its adaptive demands. Adaptations are shaped by selection, not by mutation. Assuming that the animal evolves into a white-furred species, it might become well suited to its environment and begin to flourish again. However, imagine that over time the climate begins to change and, instead of remaining cold and snowy, reverts to a more temperate climate. The white-furred animal might now be ill-suited to its environmental conditions and will face different challenges to its thriving or even survival. Again, unable to make any planned or desired changes to its genetic composition. Its fate will be left to the hazards of mutation and selection. It might well be that some changes, for example, keener nose to detect food under the snow, that had occurred as adaptations to different past conditions prove to be particularly useful in dealing with the newly changed climatic conditions. Or it might be that some past changes, for example, extra layers of fat, prove to be doubly prohibitive in adapting to the new temperate conditions. Either way, the lot of the animal will be in the unreliable hands of the evolutionary dynamic. In particular, mindful of how the Darwinian process works, it will be seen to be fatuous to talk of the black or white furred animals becoming a better or worse version of some ideal or essential form of itself. The best form an animal can be is the one that best suits it to the local environment. As that environment changes, so will the animal's optimal form. Moreover, while the animal may have some impact on its surrounding environment, it will be the environment that drives the evolutionary process and determines what is and what is not a successful mutation or improvement in any particular organism. Accordingly, from a Darwinian perspective, nature is based on nothing grander than individual organisms struggling against local conditions to maximize their own reproductive success. There is no standing accorded to claims about natural harmony or progressive refinement. Evolution is a hit and miss affair in which survival goes to the situationally lucky rather than the intrinsically worthy. Leaving aside the thorny problem of human behavior for a moment, this account of evolutionary change should be largely uncontroversial. However, its recounting should set off the alarm bells for any jurist who inquires into whether such a dynamic is at work in the legal world. To begin with, Reproductive success is not the be-all and end-all of legal development and mutations are not the stuff of pure chance. It is insufficient to simply show that law changes in response to environmental conditions or that there are, as in the natural world, some presently useless patches that were once useful structures. For example, the postal rules in contracts, and some very useful patches that arose as incidental or unintended effects of an earlier adaptive change. For example, the use of passing off taught to regulate internet domain squatting. Such demonstrations are consistent with an evolutionary dynamic, but they are also equally consistent with a whole range of competing causal and non-Darwinian explanations, especially a creationist version of adaptation by design. Moreover, while it is true that law responds to changes in its environmental conditions, it sometimes does not change at all. 
it can ignore environmental pressures or make a positive decision to hold fast in the hope that the present changes are temporary and exceptional. Furthermore, if law does decide to change, the direction in which it changes and the options available to it are often determined by forces that are internal to the law, whereas biological transformation is by necessity a step-by-step -step process in which certain structural constraints channel certain changes over time, legal change can be rapid and revolutionary, legal bears can become legal lambs almost overnight, whatever else law can or cannot do. It is not entirely at the hands of its environmental fate. The participants in the legal system can both reflect on their predicament and make changes intended to improve the situation. There is some crude marky and dynamic at work in law in that it is labile and directional. It is possible to plan for change in different ways and to anticipate different conditions. A biological system is limited to local maximizing, decision making on the basis of immediately adjacent data only, whereas, by contrast, Humans can base decisions on data distant in time and space, real or projected, in the jargon, this is global maximizing. Not that this means that law is entirely orchestrated by such internal pressures and reflective actions, but it does signify that any account of common law development that does not hold a place for conscious and planned action is severely wanting. In light of these debilitating flaws in efforts to defend an evolutionary account of the common law, it hardly seems necessary to add that human elements of will, design, and purpose which, of course, some ultra-Darwinians use evolutionary theories to support, are neither knowable entirely through experiment nor evident from the explanatory sense of the Darwinian narrative. Since Darwin's day and the first wave of social Darwinism, this unknowable component has been challenged or resisted in different ways by the claims of sociobiology, law and biology, and so on. In terms of the actual cause of change in individuals and species, the prevailing doctrine in evolutionary biology is clearly committed to the view that random change or chance errors in replication at the genetic level actually cause variation in individuals. This concept of change is at odds with most uses of the evolutionary metaphor in law and works quite against the traditional directed idea of an evolutionary narrative. As such, it would seem that the exact correspondence of law and biology is very difficult to support. Law does not have species nor does change occur independently of human endeavor. It is surely the case that human behavior is not directly subject to the theory of evolution or its explanatory power, no matter at what level evolution operates. The only plausible comparison between law and biology is in terms of relative analogy, because humans are perhaps the only beings that have been able to transform their own environment so radically. It is not easy to claim that such behavior is selected in the classical narrative sense so that there is a sense of directed change. Such behavioral patterns are better seen as integral parts of a more complex interplay between humanity and its environment. If law is a social construct and human behavior is transformative of its context, there is a very different dynamic at work from that suggested by the traditional evolutionary metaphor. Moreover, as well as its troublesome naturalistic tendencies, that is, explanatory power converts to predictive authority, and deterministic tendencies, that is, genetic or behavioral traits are predetermined, the evolutionary narrative also works equally badly when viewed from inside as opposed to outside law, it reduces law's ethical dimension to a bold and barren description. This is simply another way of attempting to further the illusion that law is separate from politics and to deny the force of the critical claim that law is politics. Efforts to overcome some of these debilitating problems have concentrated on developing a parallel and complementary process to Darwinian accounts of biological change that can explain cultural development. For instance, Jack Balkin has sought to provide an ultra-Darwinian account of how shared understandings in law grow and spread from one generation to another. Drawing on the work of Dawkins and Dennett, he picks up on an understanding of natural selection as a neutral, algorithmic process applicable to an extremely wide range of phenomena and capable of achieving immense feats by slow accumulation over large extents of time and space. Borkin contends that, while basic physiological information is contained in genes and is passed down through reproduction to new generations, there are also so-called memes that play a similar function to genes in facilitating the transmission of abstract ideas through cultural exchange over time. He argues that all mental and cultural life, including law, is adequately explainable by a mechanical Darwinian process of natural selection in which genes and memes struggle for survival, seeking to fuse concepts of function in biology and meaning in philosophy. The theory utilizes adaptionism as a fertile source of both biological and social explanations. Rejecting the notion of any Panglossian tendency at work, Balkin asserts that this evolutionary process is less Darwinian than Lamarckian in that adaptation and variation occur in direct response to the environment rather than as part of a contest between random variations to fit better the environment. In short, 
he offers a less assertive form of autopitic development using mimetic units. However, in attempting to provide a scientific basis for cultural evolution, Borkin only manages to offer a process that is unrealistically clinical and sterile in its political content. His theory of ideology is also neutral and comforting in presenting the interaction between people and their social environment as relatively benign and harmless. Moreover, the alleged analytical strength of this kind of ultra-Darwinian theorizing runs out at the very point at which it might be thought to be most needed, the Panglossian tendency cannot be so easily cabined or contained. Like all the other homological approaches, this ultra-Darwinian one bases much of its analysis on large numbers of instances occurring either in large numbers over short periods of time or in sequenced instances observed over longer periods of time. There are a couple of methodological objections to these explanations of change and development when they are applied to law. The first is a limitation of analogy. In open systems, it is impossible to recall or draw all instances of a hypothesis into its proof. There must be some selectivity and this entails criteria or principles that are external to the system. However, if the model seeks to explain all elements by this hypothesis, it must make claims to be inclusive of all instances, which is where, in an open system, the narrative technique of so-called deselection operates. Consequently, whether selecting or deselecting material, the need for some external reference is operationally required but is conceptually illegitimate. A second difficulty is with the homologies of law and biology that involve statistical analysis. Any debate about accounts of transformation or change implied by the law of large numbers soon implicates the old chestnut of freedom and necessity. At their most seductive and reductive, systems theories in both the human and natural sciences manage to elide the central questions of freedom, agency, and will. Statistical generalizations eclipse and overwhelm human initiative. In terms of law, jurists must also ask themselves when a statistical fact becomes reliable enough to become an unexamined assumption and to take explanatory precedence over individual acts. However, the tendency to draw a distinction between behavior, which follows statistical laws and is thereby predictable, and deeds, which are posited as anomalies to those statistical laws and are therefore unpredictable does not withstand critical inspection. These deeds are not just meaningless anomalies but actually comprise the important site of changes or events that are the main determinants of historical development. As Hannah Arendt put it, the application of the law of large numbers and long periods to politics or history signifies nothing less than the willful obliteration of their very subject matter, and it is a hopeless enterprise to search for meaning or significance in history when everything that is not everyday behavior or automatic trends has been ruled out as immaterial. In short, systems approaches prove both too much and too little for their own critical good. Even if law is understood as an adaptive process through which people mediate the always contingent, usually contested, and often contradictory demands of human living, there is no reason to think that it will have any great success. Indeed, the very criteria for assessing success will be as contingent and contested as the process itself. Whereas ultra-Darwinians are intent on demonstrating that almost all human behavior can be explained as having its roots and explanation in the biological adaptation to environmental conditions, traditional Darwinians insist that much human behavior is maladapted and as likely to be the unanticipated result of something that did have an adaptive function. In short, the world is too contingent and complex to submit to such reductionist accounts. Often. The answer to the ubiquitous question of what is the purpose of X? Is nothing or it depends, X might have developed as a byproduct of some other adaptive change and therefore might or might not turn out to be more useful and lasting than the initial adaptive change itself, depending on the particular environmental context. Similar to the biological world, the legal world has its share of maladaptation in that the good and the bad, the adaptive and the maladaptive, can be packaged in a single unit, the good-bad that must be taken as a whole. Law is much closer to the biological scenario of jerry-built morphology, second best physiology, and makeshift behavior than many jurists are prepared to recognize, the useless, the odd, the peculiar, the incongruous are the signs of history that are as much part of the evolutionary narrative as any other and, if excluded or marginalized, will entirely invalidate any account. One consequence of this ought to be some recognition that there is no one or even optimal strategy for dealing with the biological or legal world that can guarantee success. In addition, the adaptionist argument is banal and verging on the Panglossian in that, if adaption explains all developments, then it explains everything and, therefore, nothing. Because everything that does happen must happen, it has no critical edge or interesting force. Furthermore, some allowance has to be made for the fact that this process of adaption does not take place on a one-way street, there is two-way traffic. While law offers solutions to environmental problems, it also has an impact on that environment, 
thereby altering to it create a fresh set of problems to be resolved. This process is never ending. In the Darwinian vocabulary, adaptation is a process of becoming rather than a state of being because any reliance on the notion of perfect optimality would undercut the constant dynamism at work in nature and pave the way for the resurgence of creationist thinking. However, a commitment to resist the ambitious claims of the ultra-Darwinian theorists does not mean that a Darwinian explanation has no role to play in explaining and understanding legal development. To challenge cultural determinism is not to align oneself with the genetic determinists, and to reject the claims of sociobiologists is not to subscribe to a creationist creed. Too often, what begin as correctives to the excesses of existing theories become full-blown and equally excessive alternative theories. It is surely right to insist, as Dawkins has, that moral reflection is as much a part of human nature as anything else. However, to deny the universalistic and deterministic claims of a pseudo-scientific approach to law and adjudication is not equivalent to taking the position that moral reflection, with its emphasis on philosophical analysis and justification, is determinative or comprehensive in its description of law. Even if judges did all engage in such exclusively heady pursuits, there is no reason to think that the resulting collective abstraction would be congruent or coherent, nor would such a circumstance obviate the need for some further inquiry into the characteristics of that moral reflection and its relation to the environmental context. Indeed, the assertion that there is some presence or generation of purposes from within the legal system itself is very problematic. Even if one assumes that law can be described as something organically distinct from other practices of political human behavior, the phenomena described, that is, laws, doctrines, cases, etc., are actually characterized as passive or automated entities. However, as soon as the analysis shifts to self-movement, learning, and self-reflexivity, the entity is assumed to have some form of active life. In theoretical terms, there has been a slippage from scene to agent and from description to purpose in which the system itself is imbued with a definite normative content. From that point on, it is all too quickly and easily presumed that uniform behavior gets treated as evidence of a unity or harmony of interests. This has manifested itself as an invisible hand in classical economics, as class interests in Marxian economics, and as normative coherence in liberal jurisprudence. But, of course, Ascribing a so-called harmony of interests does not do the work of explaining transformation in law without importing an operating principle of agency from outside. In fact, these systemic narratives of evolution attempt to have it both ways in their insistence that agency and context combine to produce change. The organism of law becomes depicted as something more than a passive body of conjoined phenomena, but one that is not sufficiently active or political to be an integrated part of the larger political world. None of this need be taken as an indication that a Darwinian approach has no role to play in the jurisprudential enterprise. Darwinians are neither fatalist nor Panglossian although some of them give a good impression of being that. At the heart of all Darwinian accounts is the notion of struggle, there is no one future determined by the past's present, but there are several possible futures that people struggle to bring about through their individual and collective efforts at doing the best they can in accordance with what they think is the best. This, of course, is likely to be a haphazard, uncoordinated, and uneven process in which the collective effort might amount to much less than the sum of the individual parts. Moreover, Evolution shows that knowledge of the principles by which evolution occurs does not mean that we are any more likely to know or calculate what will happen next by predicting future development or direction. Contrary to the expectations of many scholars in law and the humanities in general, and despite the hubristic claims of some scientists, science is more accurately thought about as being in the game of local prediction, not cosmic understanding. Rather than grope vainly toward a theory of everything for everywhere at every time, it is better to think of trying to construct a workable but imprecise, travel schedule for getting from one place to another. Not only will we never know the exact nature of the traffic and why other travelers are going wherever they are going, but we also will expect delays and deviations because of changing and unpredictable local conditions and personal circumstances. From the user's standpoint, it is all about getting to the desired destination and working out a useful timetable, not finding something as big or as universal as the absolute truth about traffic, traveling, schedules or whatever, accordingly. The challenge for those who insist on the pertinence of Darwinian evolutionary insights for law is to include and explain the role that such moral reflection plays in human behavior and social development generally. What people do is affected by what people think they are doing. Unlike with other creatures in the rest of the natural world, humans are a species that has self-consciousness and, therefore, can reflect on the nature of its own doing. In this, lawyers are no different from other social actors. To different extents and with varying awareness, 
What lawyers do is affected by what it is that they think they are doing and what it is that they think they ought to be doing. Without some incorporation of that crucial element in any explanatory equation, the effort to understand judicial practice and legal development will be found wanting. However, while quantitative change will ultimately result in qualitative difference, there is no ultimate end or vision toward which change is directed. There is no perfect or ideal manifestation of humanity, society, or law. Whereas Darwin is about variation and contingency, too much contemporary jurisprudence is about convergence and purification. Insofar as the constraints on evolution are historical and environmental, behaviors only change to the extent that the local context allows or requires. As one biologist neatly captures the operation of the evolutionary dynamic, the archaic features of life merely reveal its tortuous history like the archaic features of human language or common law. Any effort to obscure or sidestep that history will fail to capture an important dynamic in law's development. Rather than being on a preordained route to some exalted or transcendental state, the common law is simply a continuing work in progress that is always moving and that is always on the road to somewhere, but never getting anywhere in particular. Conclusion In this chapter, I have introduced the basic workings of Darwinian evolution and challenged its literal and strict application to law and legal development. Any effort to respond to those strictures obliges jurists to amend their accounts of legal development. However, in so doing, it is likely that they will fall into the welcoming but suffocating embrace of either the creationists or the social Darwinians. Nevertheless, I have not sought to reject entirely the possible usefulness of such evolutionary work for jurisprudential study, it can be a helpful, if limited metaphor to think about legal development. In so suggesting, I should not be taken to be making any claim that the common law is one thing or another. In particular, I should not be read as contending that the common law does or does not function and develop in line with an attenuated evolutionary logic. The most that can be said is that, in so far as evolutionary theory has anything to say about law, and it is entirely likely that it has very little to say, it undermines mainstream accounts of the common law. By that, I mean to say that treating law as if it was susceptible to an evolutionary explanation does not advance the jurisprudential cause of those who insist on claiming a certain autonomy, simplicity, systemization, and directionality to law's development. If anything, viewing law through the lens of evolutionary theory suggests that law is politics and that the nature of that connection is unpredictable and contingent, law's operation and practice simply will not conform to a reductionist and predictive algorithm. The salutary lesson of the evolution debate is that the best story is the one that weaves together lots of different threads into a quilt that is as complex and as complementary as circumstances allow. There is no one set of simple rules that can capture or explain the complexity and contingency of life. Sadly, this lesson has been ignored. Although neither offers a convincing or useful account of the common law, the soapy sams and the bulldogs of the jurisprudential world have tended to dominate. It is to these distracting and confining influences that I now turn.